Hello guys, uh, welcome to Conversations with Cpal, a show where we showcase leaders, HR practitioners regularly. Today we're joined by an HR disruptor, Melanie. So Melanie here is the you know founder and principal of People Minded. Hi Melanie, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hi Sahid, I'm good. Thank you for having me. So you know, I, I think uh, you know, I do know that you are an HR disruptor. I do know a lot about you. However, you know, why don't you just uh, walk us through your career you know so that you know if you could tell us a little bit about your HR career you know for our audience to get to know about you. Sure absolutely so I started my HR career in small local technology companies here in Rochester mainly as a department of one and from there I really wanted to round out my HR experience and see how an HR department worked in a large corporation. So in 2010, um, I had the opportunity to join Bosch Security Systems here locally as an HR generalist and then later shifted into an HR business partner role. So I really was able to get all of the knowledge that I wanted about HR during my time at Bosch. And over time, during the uh, last couple of years, I really discovered my passion around developing people and creating work environments where employees can thrive. So I decided late last summer to branch out on my own and spent several months learning, networking, and really researching and preparing for the future of work. Wow. Uh, you know, when I do go through a LinkedIn profile, I, I see it's very comprehensive. It's very interesting. And, and you know, one thing that I've noticed, I saw that you completed a change management certificate from Cornell. Could you tell me about that, please? Sure, absolutely. So. As someone who enjoys change, and I tend to be a bit more risk-taking by nature, I felt that it was important for me to really get some perspective around the change process and to learn strategies for helping lead others through change. Because generally, people are not as um, ready for change as yes. I would say I am. So, uh, so my programs included six courses. So navigating power relationships, leading strategic change initiatives, leading organizational change and negotiation skills. And what I liked about the Cornell program is that you can customize. So I was able to choose a couple of electives around leading across cultures and coaching skills for leaders. So I really appreciated the opportunity to reflect on my past experiences with change and then to really consider how I will approach change in the future and help to lead others through it. Fantastic. So, and one other thing that I uh, noticed in your profile that uh, you had completed an emotional intelligence certification. So what is it? Absolutely. So I really wanted to gain new perspectives around emotional intelligence because I know emotional intelligence, the skills are learnable. And I feel like it's something that we really need in today's workforces and our families and our professional lives and our personal lives. So. I picked six seconds as my training provider because they have tools for youth as well as adults and organizations. So I really wanted to be able to have these skills for myself, but again, also to help me in my business. Okay, that's, that's great. So, uh, you know, good branch out from your core uh, offering, right? So why do you branch out on your own rather than joining any organization in HR role? Yes, definitely. So that's a very good question. So I did explore different HR roles and I thought that maybe I would join an organization in a talent management or talent development type role. But at the end of the day, I didn't really find anything that I felt like was a great fit for me. So most HR positions really span a variety of, um, they require a little bit of everything, which essentially I really didn't want to do. I really wanted to take the skills and passions that I have and be able to utilize them for several different companies. So it didn't take me long to realize that I really wasn't going to find the position that I wanted posted and that I was going to have to create it for myself. Wow, so, so you decided not to take an HR role in the company, but instead started your own business. So tell me about People right. Minded, I think, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I founded People Minded really on the premise that there's untapped potential in every single person organization and within the community and I wanted to be able to work with a broad range of people and organizations really help unleash that potential and help organizations develop people from within make sure there's a good match and alignment between the values of individuals as well as the values 
of the company. So it's really about having the right fit in an organization and, and getting in touch with that authenticity of, of people. And again, then making sure that they're in the right roles within an organization. So, so that is what I want to be doing through People Minded and what I've been helping some of my clients with. Wow. So, you know, could you tell me a bit about your clients? You know, like rather who comes to you for help? Sure. Absolutely. So, so my clients are generally feeling pain of some kind. So the individuals who come to me are generally people who say, you know what? I've done X, Y, Z my whole career. I really want to do something that fulfills me a bit more and gives me a sense of purpose. And I will work with them to help figure out what that might be. And with organizations, a lot of times they're frustrated. They're not able to hire the right people. Um, they're Just the way they've always done things isn't working anymore. And a lot of times their HR team either doesn't have the bandwidth or the expertise to really take on a major change initiative, or they may not have an HR department at all. So, so you know, you, you mentioned pain. So what kind of pain are you referring to? Absolutely. So, so the pain that really comes with hiring and retaining talent. So it's sort of like a boat, right? You're plugging a hole and so you get the boat filled and then a hole pops up somewhere else because you have people leaving. So, so okay. that's the type of pain, right? That, that just making sure that the, the organization stays staffed with the right people and that um, people are engaged and, and enjoying what they're doing and being able to be as productive as possible. Okay, yeah. So you know, you know, on that note, uh, you know, I would like to kind of deep dive into this. how does, say, the current talent landscape look? And you know, could you talk about uh, a bit about the pain that organizations are feeling with regard to attracting and retaining talent? Sure, we could probably actually do a whole podcast just around this specific <laughs> topic. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, okay. it, it's something that basically everybody that I've been talking with is, is kind of dealing with the same thing. So simply, it's a candidate's market. And in many cases, candidates are receiving multiple offers at once. And with those candidates, money is, is really rarely the deciding factor. More often than not, it's the work that they're going to be doing, the company culture, and anticipated opportunities for growth. So what I found really interesting in this market is that several local companies are getting really creative with regards to how they're addressing this issue. So I'm not sure if you saw Harris recently launched a return to work program to help attract people who have been out of the workforce for, I believe it's two years or more. So for example, yeah. if a parent had been home raising their family, Harris has a program that will help transition them back into the workplace. Because again, trying to hire engineers is very difficult right now. Um, another example would be what Isaac at Heating and Cooling is doing with their Isaac University. So they created a 12-week program where candidates with no experience can come in and get the training they need to be an HVAC, HVAC technician, which is so cool. Yes. So, you know, the one thing I would add there is, is the company spends so much time on recruiting and you see postings for recruiters all over the place, but I really can't help but wonder if some of the time and attention that's spent on recruiting was really shifted to some of these more creative programs and develop, developing talent internally, what that might mean for, for businesses. Okay, but, but, you know, don't some organizations uh, have people designated specifically to talent development? Sure. And, and again, this is one of those positions that I thought I might um, get in an organization before I decided to start People Minded. But what I found is that most large companies well, they have a have a person or a department designated to talent development. It's generally not for everyone. So larger organizations will often have a high potential program or development for those that ask for it. But I really feel like there's a missed opportunity with an employee who may have never had anyone believe in them or tell them that they were good enough or that they would never have the confidence or courage to reach out and apply for a different position or work towards anything else within their organization so but you know aren't there some employees who are just happy doing what they're doing and probably they do not want to kind of get into all of this development or anything of that nature definitely there definitely are some folks that right there they're comfortable doing what they're doing However, I would suggest that when employees think about development, they often think about a completely different role. 
And it doesn't have to be the case. It could mean that development, they often think about a completely different role. And it doesn't have to be the case. It could mean that an employee learns a new skill in their current role or sheds a more junior task, or you know, maybe it's something that they've mastered and they're no longer engaged by it that a newer person could take on so that they can then take on a more challenging task. So it's really those little baby steps within a role. And that shifting of tasks really becomes a win-win-win for the organization, for the employee who gets to take on new things, and then the newer employee who may get to take on those more junior tasks. So um, I can give you an example. Locally, Innovative Solutions has a really unique employee-led promotion process where employees can, can sort of do those baby steps, and they work with their their um, leader and with the, the their uh, VP of people to help kind of move them through that process. Um, the other thing that they do that I think is really, really cool is when a new employee starts, they can go through their job description and, and sort of select tasks. And if they feel that something is not within their skill set, they can ask to have it removed. And so skills will be, or not skills, but tasks rather, will be shifted around to make sure that people really are in the right roles and that they're doing things that they're um, good at and really engaged by. So another really interesting thing to think about. Interesting, you know, you know, when I talk about Siebel, you know, at Siebel, you, we look to develop leaders from within because everyone who joins in, there's no, we do not hire leaders from outside, so we promote them organically. So what advice would you give to a company like us? Sure, and no, absolutely, that's a great question. So I read an article recently that talked about moving into a people leadership role from a functional role really shouldn't be seen as a promotion, but rather as a career change, a career change. And I really thought that was genius because oftentimes what makes an employee successful in their functional role, is not the same skill set that's going to make them successful leading people. So my advice to your organization and others with the same question would be to really demonstrate to employees that growth comes in many forms and making sure that you're looking for leaders across the organization and really looking for those innate leadership skills, those natural leadership skills. So again, employees who, who want to grow don't believe that that's their only path. And that those who do move into those leadership roles really are the people who have that natural ability and desire. Yeah. So, you know, let's uh, shift gears here for a minute. So we've talked about having people in the right roles and about employee development. You also mentioned that, you know, culture is an important consideration for candidates. So what do you think employers could do to ensure that culture is attractive to potential employees? Absolutely. So I really think the key here is that different cultures will be attractive to different people and that it's really about finding a good match. So from 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 an employer's perspective, it's not just about looking at skills and, and whether or not an employee can, can do the work. It's really about looking at, at the candidate or the employee's needs and desires as well and making sure that there's a, that there's a good match. So, so for example, you may have a great candidate who can do the work that you need done, but they really might want to be focused more on current cutting edge technology and solving complex problems. And if the position that you have available or, or the culture is not cutting edge, it may not be a fit, even if the person can do the work. Mm -hmm. So so are there any common threads that you've seen across all candidates and industries? You know, if I had to pick one thing, I would have to say that regardless of the role or the industry, that at the end of the day, people just really want to feel like they're adding value and that they're contributing to something bigger and also that they're being valued and recognized for the work they're doing. I, I've often heard people say, you know, I just, I, I don't want to be micromanaged uh, because the, again, people want to do a good job. Like as human beings, we want to do a good job. So again, putting people in those positions and in those roles to do their best work possible and then thanking them for a job well done. Yeah, but you know, on that note, but for a business, don't customers come first? Because without customers, I mean, there's no business. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so oftentimes you hear companies talking about, you know, people first or customers first. And as Richard Branson had so eloquent, eloquently put it, um, if you take care of your employees, they will take care of your customers and your clients. So 
I believe that the correlation between top workplaces, places that have a great culture, and that link that you see in terms of growth and profit, there's really something behind that. So, so I'll share another example of a local company that I've seen is, is Optimax. So a, a local top employer who is also growing by leaps and bounds and expanding. So last year, there was an article recently written about this, that they had a client that alerted them to a quality issue. And it was over the weekend, and their employees didn't wait till Monday. They, they jumped right into action and made sure that the right product was delivered to their client 12 hours later, out of state. So it wasn't like threats or bribes or, hey, we need to do this, that forced these people into action. It was, it was truly the culture and the fact that they're intrinsically motivated to do a good job for their employer. They take personal ownership in what they're doing. And I'm sure the fact that... Um, Everybody truly feels a sense of ownership within the company because Optimax has a great profit sharing program, also helps people feel committed. And they know that their work, that they're valued and that it truly contributes to the bottom line and that they have a stake in that. Wow. I mean, it sounds like Optimax has done a great job branding themselves as an employer of choice. However, you know, how important is employer brand for employees and prospects? in terms of you know how it would affect them and yeah absolutely so so every business really has an employer brand whether they realize it or not and with the growth and popularity of sites like Glassdoor and Indeed candidates are really doing their homework before they sometimes even before they apply for a position but but oftentimes for sure before they go into an interview or accept an offer so just like a business would research a potential vendor Candidates are also doing um, doing their due diligence. So businesses really have a higher likelihood of having a positive employment brand if their people strategy is given equal focus as their business strategy. And that's really the case with a lot of the organizations that I've mentioned um, throughout the course of our conversation here. So employment brand also, it's, it's not just something that matters to potential candidates, but also potential clients. So as I shared with that example of Optimax, Satisfied employees are are more likely to jump in and and be intrinsically motivated to go and be above and beyond to meet those client expectations. So a strong, positive employment brand for a company could not only mean the difference between attracting and hiring and retaining a great candidate, a great employee, but also having a leading you to a great new client and having a client choose your organization over another one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, uh, moving on, so what do you think is the difference between employer brand and employee value proposition, so EVP? And also, how do you think companies today are looking at EVP? Probably could you also walk us through a couple of examples in this regard and, you know, what companies have done to enhance their EVP and also if you could shed some light on, probably advise us on how companies or rather what companies can do to enhance the EVP? Sure. So, so as I mentioned, every company really has an employment brand, whether they realize it or not. Whereas the employee value proposition is a much more intentional effort on behalf of the company to really define that employee experience and what it means to work for XYZ company. So an EVP really incorporates various aspects of values, benefits, culture into a well-defined marketing tool. And again, it's not only to attract new employees, but really to retain the employees that you have. So it's also really important to make sure that that EVP is truly representative of the employee experience and the culture so that when current employees see it, they can really look at it and say, yes, this resonates with me. Yeah. So, you know, what advice do you have for employees who are interested in creating an EVP? Sure. So, so it's not about recreating the wheel or, you know, creating something new from scratch. Companies can start with the pieces of the puzzle that they already have. So, again, things like what are the values, what are the benefits and the core differentiators, and what do employees experience on a daily, daily basis? What makes it a great place to work? So it's also important, again, to understand what employees value and getting their input into this. So so again, I'll give you an example of a company. Um, When I was with Bosch, we created an EVP for North America. And what was great is that it took a lot of those foundational aspects that Bosch was already known for. 
So diversity, social responsibility, innovation, and repackage them into eight key principles. So one of the competencies that Bosch is really well known for is a culture of diversity and inclusion. So that competency was converted into the principle, be yourself. So when you work at Bosch, be yourself, bring your true self every day. And then the principle around make your mark really incorporated the slogan that Bosch is known for invented for life. So again, meant to target those individuals who want to work in new cutting edge technology and be a part of something bigger. So to, to start, if a company wants to create a, an EVP, summarizing those, those core aspects and what the business is already known for, and it doesn't need to be eight principles to start, it could really be three or four, and, and using those to say, hey, this is us, this is what you get when you work here. Great. So uh, again, you know, speaking of uh, cutting edge technology, how do you see technology impacting the HR functions in the years to come? Absolutely. So I strongly believe that technology is really going to impact every aspect of the HR function. And it's going to mean different things for different businesses depending on where they already are in terms of technology maturity in the HR function. So it may for some companies mean implementing self-service tools that have been around for, for a while now, uh, but, but some companies still don't have them. So giving employees that ability to check their pay stubs, request time off, investigate policies and procedures without needing to speak to somebody directly in HR. So for others, it might mean ditching the employee review process and shifting to software that enables not only managers, but employees to provide continuous feedback. And then for others who are already pretty pretty far along in the realm of technology, it might mean utilizing virtual reality to provide a job preview for a potential employee and what it looks like to be in this position. So, I mean, it's really cool the things that technology is enabling us to do. And, and truly, it's going to impact so many things. Yeah. So, so you know, speaking of uh, virtual reality and you know, uh, my mind kind of goes to videos. So... What do you think about the videos that many employees make and share on their websites, like join us, company culture? What is your take on those videos? Yeah, absolutely. And again, videos, are, I mean, they're everywhere, right? Reading has kind of gone to the wayside and videos and, and podcasts like what we're doing here today are sort of what people are, are looking for now, right? Something quick. So I do think videos are great and they tell a piece of the story at a high level so that as prospective employees, again, are doing their homework, doing their due diligence, they can really get a feel for whether or not that employer may be a fit for them. I guess my caution would be around making sure that people don't get too clouded, right? And say, oh, this place looks like a really great place to work or this culture and, and really making sure that they're still paying attention as they're going through the interview process and, and the feel that they're getting for the people that they meet and the work themselves. Because like I said early on, what may be a great culture for one person uh, may not really be a great culture for somebody else. Yes, yes, absolutely right. So, you know, building on a conversation about technology, what would you say to business owners, managers, or HR professionals who say that remote work won't work for their business or their people? Yeah, no, another another great question. So, I would really circle them back to think about the results that they're looking to achieve and challenge them to think about whether is a physical presence required in the office or is it, well, this is the way it's always been, and I like to be able to go down the hallway and ask so-and-so a question, and, and you know, I like them to be there when I need them. So for some positions, a presence in the office will certainly still be the case, but technology is enabling work to get done in so many creative ways. And it's not only a matter of people who have been in the office, you know, being able to, to work remote, but it's also a matter of alternative work arrangements. And as I've been doing some of my research, the data that I've seen kind of shows that in the next seven to 10 years, 1099 freelancers will actually outnumber W-2 employees, which is kind of crazy that yeah. it won't be employees that are necessarily getting the bulk of the work done in the future. Like employers are really going to have to get creative with how they get work done and how they have their talent pool um, organized. So what's interesting and, and what I have to keep reminding some of my clients about is that our local talent pool really isn't our local talent pool. 
And many of our, our folks here in Rochester are already working for different companies in different cities, um, even as far as around the world. So, um, so that eight to five schedule in the future of work, you know, being in the office um, is, is only part of the equation. And it's really around looking at technology enabling non-employees to, to do the work as well. Yeah. So, so you know, early on, uh, you know, if I had to kind of circle back uh, to the initial phase of our conversation, you mentioned getting certified in emotional intelligence. So what exactly is emotional intelligence and how do you see emotional intelligence fitting into the future of work? Absolutely. So emotional intelligence really at the most basic level is becoming smarter with feelings. And oftentimes when you think about emotions and feelings and work, right, you think drama, um, but it's really important that, I, I feel like a lot of times that's what we've lost in organizations, is we take the feeling and the emotion out of it. So, and it's not necessarily, again, you think about drama, you think about emotion. It's really thinking about how we use those to guide our decision-making process and to make sure that we're making decisions with people in mind. So. The other thing I think about is how we can control and sort of manage and navigate our own emotions. So when we think about that impact of technology and the future of work, right, and some of the things I talk about in terms of non-employees doing some work formerly done by, by W-2 direct employees, we can also choose how we feel about that, right? And, and what I've been encouraging people to do is not necessarily think about the fear in that loss of what we know, but to think about the opportunities that lie ahead as a result of those changes. So being able to kind of shift that that emotion of fear to an emotion of excitement and anticipation around possibilities. So the other piece around emotional intelligence is, and in, in around that excitement, is that thinking about some of the manual processes and the manual repetitive tasks that are part of some roles, when you combine technology and what it will enable people to do with emotional intelligence, it allows employees and people in general to be able to take on more cognitive tasks, right? More challenging tasks yeah. and to really utilize more of their distinctively human capabilities. So again, not letting that fear of change kind of overcome things, but really looking at it as excitement about possibilities. Yeah. So, Simi, you also, you know, I called you an HR disruptor when I first introduced you. So, and the reason I did that was because you took the step to bring Disrupt HR to Rochester this year. So, can you share a little bit about what Disrupt HR is and what prompted you to do that? Absolutely. So I'm so excited about Disrupt HR. So Rochester has now joined 139 other cities from around the world in a movement to really disrupt HR and improve the future of work. So for those who aren't familiar with Disrupt HR, it's really a TED Talk style information sharing event. And we will have between 10 and 12 presenters who will each do a five minute presentation. 20 PowerPoint slides, all automated, all automated, sorry about that. And the goal is really to teach me something and make it quick. So it's meant to be a super empowering, exciting event. And it's also not just for HR people. So HR professionals, leaders, um, individuals with, with cool technology that again, may enable HR uh, people to do their jobs different. So it's really an opportunity to bring together all those local disruptors in one place, shed some light on the progressive ideas and the practices and the things that are already happening here locally. And again, trying to shift some of that underlying fear about the future to, to really about the excitement for the possibilities that lie ahead. That, that, that sounds really exciting. So when is this a pitch out and how do people get involved in it? Sure. So our first event is scheduled for the evening of Tuesday, April 30th. It will be at the Rochester Academy of Medicine on East Avenue. And it's a super cool location with a, with a cool theater. And um, again, really looking forward to having that as our venue. So, but again, we're also looking for sponsors who could really benefit from getting exposure with this audience that's going to be looking for and ready for fresh ideas, inspiring products and services, 
um, that will really help them navigate that future of work. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's my personal call out to all of the sponsors and disruptors out there. Come on, it's in Rochester. So uh, also, you know, on that note, so do you think Disrupt HR will be a one-time event? Well, I certainly hope not. You know, at a minimum, I see it being a, a yearly event where we'll bring people together and keep updating people on what's new. Uh, but I also, I really want to know what people who participate in the event, right, what people want. So kind of tossing around ideas around a mastermind group and, and how can we kind of support one another moving forward um, into the future of work. And again, definitely open to ideas because that's what the spirit of Disrupt HR is all about. Okay, so, uh, you know, I think our uh, time is almost up, Melanie. Uh, you know, I'm going to close this now. So, you know, do you have you know, any closing statements for the HR professionals listening to this podcast? And also, you know, if you'd be, uh, I'd like to know if you'd be open for a few questions, if one of our audience wants to reach you out and, you know, if you could tell us the best place to reach you at, that'd be great as well. Sure, absolutely. So, so as HR professionals, it's so easy to get sucked into the day-to-day and putting out fires, right? You never know what your day is going to be and what emergency is going to pop up. So as you call for me, that happened in 2017, I had the opportunity to attend the SHRM National Conference. And I really hadn't realized how much HR had evolved and benefits and just everything until I really saw it on that big stage firsthand. So at a minimum, I'm not necessarily saying people have to get out and, you know, go to a big conference, but just little things like local events and getting active on LinkedIn. There are so many great influencers out there that I follow and, and, you know, I take a peek at their stuff just about every day. So companies like the Corporate Rebels, Liz Ryan, who's a former HR professional herself, uh, Marcus Buckingham, Forbes, Harvard Business Review. And now Sepal Corp are all in my list of organizations that I keep track of all the time. So, so HR professionals, we've worked hard to get a seat at the table as a business partner. And I truly, truly feel like staying savvy around technology and everything that's to come will help keep that seat at the table. So I would tell everybody listening to the call to really um, lead the change, get in front of the change and be the change. If anybody is interested in getting in touch with me and learning more or has questions, you can reach me at um, peopleminded.com, people-minded.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out, uh, connect, send a message. And I look forward to working with folks here locally in the future of work. Oh, and I should also add that Disrupt HR, so if you want to find Disrupt HR, Uh, disrupthr.co and you can search for Rochester. You can also go out and look at other events on the webpage for different cities and get a feel for what some of the talks look like. So if there's anybody interested in potentially speaking and you wonder what what it's all about, you can get a feel for, um, again, what some of the other cities have done. Fantastic. So... um... (laughs) You can also find, you know, the links for Melanie's website and Disrupt HR in the description. Please uh, browse through Disrupt HR and, you know, share your thoughts. Wow. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that, Melanie, and to all of our audience as well. So we're signing off on our episode two and stay tuned for our channel for more episodes on this.